Welcome everyone to today's clinical trial presentation hosted by FPWR and PWSA USA. I'm Susan Hedstrom, the Executive Director for FPWR, and I'll be ask, acting as today's moderator. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Clinical trials are the first steps towards approved treatments for PWS, and participation is an incredible contribution that you can make for our community. Today's presenters are from Harmony Biosciences, and they'll be sharing information to help you understand what you can expect should you choose to participate in the phase two study of patolescent. Time will be reserved at the end of today's call for Q&A, but please feel free at any time to submit your questions through the Q&A right here on Zoom. With that said, I'd like to hand it off to our presenters from Harmony. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, I'm Rachel Radomski, Head of Patient Advocacy at Harmony Biosciences. I wanted to say a huge thank you to the Foundation for Greater Early Research and PWSA USA for allowing us to share a little bit more information about our phase two study evaluating the safety and efficacy of patolicin in patients with PWS. We've made um, some changes to this trial and are excited um, to share those with the community today. But I'd like to start just by introducing Harmony and sharing who we are. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, um, Harmony is a ph pharmaceutical company headquartered outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, dedicated to developing and commercializing therapies for people living with rare neurologic neurological disorders who have unmet needs. Um, we were established in 2017 by our partner, uh, BioProje, and we became a public company in August of 2020 and have about 160 employees. And one thing I'm very passionate about, as are my colleagues on this call, is keeping patients at the heart of everything we do. And uh, on the bottom right, you'll see um, our clinical development pipeline in the disease areas where we're working to serve uh, people living with rare neurological conditions, including PWS. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our chief medical officer, Dr. Jeffrey Dano, to talk a little bit about our journey in Prater Willey syndrome and the changes we've made to our phase two clinical trial. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rachel, and uh, thank you, Susan. And um, on behalf of the clinical development team at Harmony, I also want to thank FPWR and um, PWSUSA for you know the opportunity to you know provide an update on our phase two clinical trial. First, I want to share a little bit about you know Harmony's path to you know the Prader Willi uh, syndrome and working with the Prader Willi community. So we were founded, as Rachel said, in October 2017. And just two months later, we attended a meeting at the NIH with uh, members of the prader um, you know, patient community about the potential of doing a clinical development program with patolicin in patients with PWS. In October 2018, we attended our first FPWR annual meeting. And then in 2019, there was a publication of a case series of children with PWS that were on patolicin and some of the observations, and they were on patolicin through what's called FDA personal importation um, before it was actually approved. In October of 2019, we were back at the annual meeting for FPWR, and we presented um, our first time we presented our concept of this phase two clinical trial and sharing it with the PWS community. Uh, we opened what's called an investigational new drug application or an IND for PWS in October, 2019. And, and then uh, in December, uh, we did what's called a phase one pharmacokinetic or PK trial, measuring sort of the blood levels of patolicin in some of the children with PWS who had been on patolicin through FDA personal importation. In 2020, um, in December of that year, we started and initiated this phase two trial uh, in patients with PWS. And we're excited today to provide some latest updates and some changes that we've made in the trial design, you know, mainly with the, the intent to you know, lessen the burden you know, of the trial and, and some of the aspects for the patients and families um, to be able to participate. Next slide, Rachel. So in terms of um, what this study is evaluating, you know, the primary objective or the, or the main objective 
looking at the safety of patolicin and how well it is tolerated uh, in people living with PWS, as well as the effectiveness of patolicin in treating excessive daytime sleepiness or EDS. But in addition to that primary main objective, we're also looking at some key secondary outcomes. And they include the effect of patolicin on behavior, uh, learning, attention, memory, what we call, refer to as cognitive function. And secondly, impact on, on the caregiver of a person with PWS. Obviously, um, I don't have to tell all of you, the family dynamic and the impact on the caregiver is also very important. And we'll also be looking at the effect of patolicin on hunger, the hyperphagia, the sort of the, you know, the food behavior. And the thinking is that um, excessive daytime sleepiness or EDS could have downstream effects. And, you know, when people with PWS are excessively sleepy or really tired and some of that irritability, it could affect the behavior, cognitive function, um, as well as um, food behavior as well. So we're looking at all of these outcomes, you know, to, to learn more of the effect of patolicin on, on, on all these different symptoms. Next slide. So what's changed and um, what are we excited about to try to make this clinical tri trial, you know, a bit easier for patients and families to participate. So mainly the main change is that the overnight sleep study and daytime sleep studies are no longer required. So patients do not have to go into the sleep lab to do these assessments. These will be measured by subjective scales that we have, um, and that will be used to assess the, the level of sleepiness in patients at baseline at the beginning of the trial, and then throughout the trial and at the end point. In addition, um, we've made some changes and you know, designed in flexibility to allow for a remote screening visit. So patients and families don't have to, trial to uh, travel to the clinical sites, as well as some more flexibility uh, allowing remote visits during both the double blind um, phase of the trial and the open label extension that I'll, I'll speak to later. Next slide. So some key inclusion criteria, so criteria that must be met uh, to be eligible to enroll in the trial. So obviously, first off, um, a genetically confirmed diagnosis of PWS. Uh, patients must demonstrate adequate sleep duration at night, and this is captured through a sleep diary during the screening phase, um, and has um, a level of EDS, excessive daytime sleepiness, based on these subjective scales that, that I mentioned before. Um, and also, um, patient must have a consistent caregiver who is willing and able to complete the required assessments um, at each time you know, throughout the trial. Next slide. So what about um, medications that patients are on that are being you know, sort of managed day to day for PWS? And we get these questions frequently. You know, can you still take the medications and participate in the trial? So two major classes of medications, you know, one, wake promoting treatments such as stimulants, modafinil, or modafinil, you know, that could affect the EDS. So, so um, patients that are on these can participate in the trial. They have to be on a stable dose for at least 28 days prior to the screening phase and agree to continue on the stable dose for the duration of the double blind treatment phase of the trial. In the open label extension, um, patients can have adjustments to these medications during that phase of the trial, but have to remain at stable dose for the double blind phase. And it's the same with um, sedating medications such as what are called hypnotics or benzodiazepines. A lot of these medications that are prescribed um, to manage some of the behavioral symptoms. So it's the same approach. Patients can participate if they're on a stable dose for at least 28 days prior to screening and remain on stable dose throughout the double blind phase. So being on these medications does not preclude participation in this phase two trial. Next slide. 
So turning to some um, key exclusion criteria. So any of these criteria that would exclude someone from participating in the trial. So obviously, if they have a diagnosis of another genetic or chromosomal disorder, different than PWS. Secondly, someone who has untreated obstructive sleep apnea or is at high risk for OSA based on some screening tools and things that the clinical trial site um, can do to see if someone is at high risk. Uh, thirdly, if um, patient family doesn't agree to discontinue any prohibited medications um, that would be you know, prohibited during the trial, usually for safety reasons or drug interaction reasons. Um, or lastly, is receiving um, a medicine that's known to prolong what's called the QT interval. That it's a, it's a measure of um, in the heart, heart function um, because spitolicin can affect the QT interval and um, for safety reasons, you, you can't be on other medications that are known to prolong that measure in, in, in the heart. Next slide. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Crystal Davis, um, our lead on clinical operations for this trial to provide some more specific information about how all this uh, works. Crystal? Thanks, Dr. Dano. So, um... As a patient, what can you expect as a participant in the study? Well, the first visit is a screening visit in which the doctor will review your medical history. They'll ask questions to make sure you're eligible for the study. And depending on the site and the study doctor you go to, you might have the visit or you might have the option to do this visit remotely uh, as already mentioned. And if so, the, the study doctor will perform some of these tests and procedures at the next visit that will be on site instead, such as blood sample collections for safety labs, physical exams, things like that. At the next visit, which is the baseline visit or visit two, that, it, that must be performed on site. And the study doctor will review all of the information from the screening visit to make sure you're still eligible. And then after you complete some tests and procedures, and the study doctor says you're still good to go, um, the doctor will talk to you about how to take your study drug the next day. And during this part of the study, the double blind phase, um, no one will know what type of study drug you're on, whether that's patolicent or placebo. And so of the 60 patients that will be enrolled in the study, 20 will be given a higher dose of patolicent for their age group, 20 will be given a lower dose of patolicent for their age group, and the other 20 will be given placebo. So when a patient agrees to be in the study, they'll be randomly assigned to one of three groups. And then talking about visits three and four, um, you may have the option to do those visits remotely as well. And if so, a nurse will go to your home for those in-person procedures like the safety labs and physical exam, and the study doctor will do everything else by telemedicine. If you do happen to go on site, everything will just be um, performed on site as normal. And then finally, visit five, it serves two purposes, and that those would be the end of the double blind phase of the study, and also the first visit of the open label extension phase of the study, in which participants have the option to receive patolicent at a dose appropriate for their age. So after a patient completes all the tests and procedures and the study doctor says that uh, you can start the open label extension, then they'll tell you how to start titration of the patolicent and they'll give you enough to last until your next study visit. So after that, you'll return to the clinic every three months for the next year, and then every six months after that, or until you decide to either discontinue, for this, discontinue the study um, or the study ends. And um, again, as far as remote visits and flexibility, you might have the option to do some of those uh, virtually or remotely as well. Next slide, please. So as the caregiver, what should you expect? Well, the caregiver should be someone that's 
that knows the patient well, that's knowledgeable and reliable, um, typically a parent or family member or other responsible adult that knows the patient well and can commit to participating in each study visit. Um, not only that, the caregiver should expect to go on site with the patient for each subject visit, complete study questionnaires and assessments during those visits, uh, they should expect to help the patient complete the sleep diary at the screening visit or during the screening period, uh, which tracks sleep, as well as tracks study drug dosing throughout the double blind phase. They need to help make sure the patient is taking the study drug properly every morning and help with scheduled telephone calls with the site and the study doctor um, when they ask about how things are going and if there have been changes in medications and, and just general health. So um, overall, each patient that's partaking in this particular study needs someone there to support him or her uh, throughout the double blind and open label phases. Next slide, please. So where can you go to participate in the study? Well, as you can see, uh, we have 15 sites spread across the US, uh, several sites in California, two in Texas, several in the Northeast, and then just uh, kind of throughout the Midwest here. And Harmony does recognize that, um, you know, with there being only 15 sites, you might have to get in a plane to get to your closest site. You might be driving a couple of hours. So Harmony will pay for travel and the associated costs to and from the study visits, such as flights, uh, hotels, meals, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, you don't have to pay for that yourself. And so if you are interested in participating in the study, the site contact information is actually all listed out on clinicaltrials.gov. And you can also reach out to Harmony directly if you have questions about which site you might need to go to or any other questions about the study in general. And that email is on the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, um, thanks, Crystal. So lastly, um, as Crystal was alluding to, you know, after the double blind phase of the study is an open label extension phase um, that patients who complete the, the double blind phase have the option to enter into this extension phase, that, you know, during which they'll receive open label patolicin, um, you know, throughout the course of um, this phase of the trial. And the reason for this is to collect, you know, longer term safety information, as well as information on the effectiveness um, of patolicin on, on some of the outcomes that we spoke to before. Uh, before. Um, as Crystal also mentioned, you know, during this, you'll have periodic check-ins with um, the trial sites, um, continue to receive the um, patolicin um, open label drug, and some of the visits on site and others where we have flexibility or they can be done remotely. So, you know, this is the option at, at the end of the double blind phase to be able to remain on patolicin, um, you know, if, if it's showing to be um, effective, and we'll be collecting you know, more information um, during this phase of the trial. So next slide. So with that, I just want to close. And, um, you know, I would say that if you have any more questions or, you know, specific questions um, that aren't addressed today, you know, please feel free to reach out to our Harmony team. This is the email uh, that Crystal alluded to. It's clinical trials at harmonybiosciences.com. There's also more information on clinicaltrials.gov, you know, on this phase two trial. And, you know, we remain, you know, very committed to, um, you know, completing this phase two clinical trial. Obviously the data will inform us and then we would look to the opportunity to, con you know, continue the clinical development program you know, in, in pursuit of an approved indication for patolicin in people living with Prader-Willi syndrome. So with that, I wanna thank all of you for your, your interest um, and your attention today. I think we'll do some Q&A. And again, on behalf of Harmony, um, our thanks to FPWR and PWSA USA 
for setting this webinar up today. Susan? Thank you so much, Jeff and Crystal and Rachel. This presentation has really been phenomenal. I think you guys did a great job laying out um, you know, what a person can expect if they were to participate in this trial. Uh, we, we will spend the next few minutes answering questions. For those of you new to Zoom, you can submit a question using Q&A. You'll find an icon for Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, you just type your question into the text field and we will answer those questions as they come through. So to help get us started, um, could your team help us understand how do we know if our loved one is eligible for the study? We know they need to have some daytime sleepiness. What does what might this look like? How sleepy does a person need to be? So I think that, um, you know, I, I think that it, it's basically just, you know, observations. If, um, you know, someone is falling asleep, um, you know, frequently during the daytime when they should be awake, um, or they're just, you know, looking, you know, sort of drowsy and low energy level. It, you know, it may not just be only overt sleepiness, um, you know, but, you know, energy level, activity level. And then ultimately, if, if there's any suspicion, you know, that they are excessively sleepy, um, then, you know, they should reach out to, you know, one of the clinical trial sites, reach out to our team. And then that'll be sort of formally assessed by these, you know, these measures that we have to see if there is a, an adequate level of excessive sleepiness, which is the main criterion for someone to be eligible to participate in the trial. And then obviously the other symptoms, the behavioral symptoms and cognitive symptoms um, and, you know, levels of hyperphagia uh, will also be, you know, assessed at study entry. That's interesting that you mentioned patients may not necessarily need to be falling asleep throughout the day. Um, I think that there was that there's a perhaps a misconception that they have to be falling asleep all the time during throughout the daytime, and, and that may not necessarily be correct. Yeah, that's correct, Susan. I mean, even just you know. Sometimes um, there's what's called sort of micro sleeps and where you just doze off, um, you know, briefly, and it's not like a sort of full type of nap. And mm -hmm. but that's happening in the background um, fairly frequently. So the sum total of what we call sleep pressure, um, the pressure to sleep, you know, based on our sleep wake cycle, you know, we should be asleep at night and awake during the day, but you know, the thinking is in Prader Willi is that sleep wake switch is not stable. So um, actually, people are not sleeping as well at night, what's called disrupted nighttime sleep. So during the day, there's that sleep pressure. It may look like long naps, or it may just look like someone dozing off briefly um, or these micro sleeps. And but that'll ultimately be measured in the scales that we use to see if someone, you know, would be eligible. Mm -hmm. And who is the person? I'm oh, sorry, Crystal. Sorry about that. Just to add to that, um, many of the sites will do a pre-screening call if you're interested in the study, and they can help determine uh, based on the information you provide as the caregiver, um, you know, if this, if the, if the child or uh, participant seems sleepy enough. And so, um, just to add on to that, I see a question in the chat box about a child being a, a good historian. So the questionnaires that pertain to our endpoints, uh, the subjective scales, they are reported by the caregivers. Um, we realize that the person with PWS may not necessarily be the greatest historian, um, so would rely on the caregiver specifically for that information. Yeah, yeah, that's a great that's a great point, Crystal. So both. You know, who is doing the reporting in, in terms of um, the level of sleepiness. And then as Crystal mentioned, so the pre-screening, um, again, to avoid going traveling to the site um, where you're not really sure to help, uh, again, as much, you know, taking as much of the burden out of the trial. So that pre-screening call, you know, with you know, the family um, can help, you know, kind of indicate if someone, you know, would be eligible. That's really great to have that pre-screening call because you know, travel can be challenging, especially if the site isn't in, in your region or your city. 
Um, so thank you for allowing for parents to do that without having to pull their kids out of school to go drive to it or fly even to a site. We have a couple of questions about medical records and tests that are done during the study. Um, so first, you know, in regards to medical records, do you review uh, um, the patient's medical records as part of the trial? So, um, yes, yeah, so the medical records, um, you know, will be, will be reviewed, you know, by the clinical investigators at the site. So if they, you know, the patients are not known to the principal investigators at the site, they'll review the medical records, confirm the diagnosis of PWS, as well as just get familiar with the medical history, you know, of that patient, um, you know, if they are eligible to come into the trial. Mm -hmm. And can you share what type of tests are typically done when you go in person to a visit? So the tests that are done are mainly, um, so, you, you know, patients are examined. So physical examination is done along with vital signs. Um, and then laboratory studies, you know, blood is drawn for, you know, lab studies uh, to make sure patients will be eligible. And then it's really, um, the assessments um, around the level of sleepiness, the behavioral scales, um, the cognitive scales, uh, the hyperphagia, you know, questionnaire. So the, those are, you know, really, as opposed to um, sort of, you know, routine medical care, you know, most of what is being done are the assessments for the clinical trial when someone is coming to a site to participate in the trial. And just to add to that as well, you know, we know that coming into the trial site for these visits, um, it can take a couple hours or more. So we did want to remove as much of the burden as possible from the participant or patient themselves. So the only thing that the patient would really need to do is complete a brief computer test. The rest of the scales and the questionnaires are with the caregiver. Mm -hmm. And for the screening call, does that involve the, the person with PWS at all, or is that just between the PI or the intake coordinator and the parent or the caregiver? That can be up to them, uh, the family, how they want to proceed with that. Okay. Um, you mentioned that I, I believe one of the visits you said could be lengthy, perhaps one or two hours. Is that, could you verify what people can expect for length of visits? I would say a minimum of a couple hours, most likely longer. And that's just due to uh, the collection of safety labs, the blood draws, uh, the questionnaires, going through the consent forms, especially for those earlier visits. Um, and there is one longer visit for um, the, what I call the PK visit in which we have multiple blood samples taken throughout the day. That would be, um, most of, actually majority of the day. Yeah, and that and that's just for one of the visits. So, you know, we're, we're also trying to sort of, you know, measure the patolescent levels and correlate that, you know, with the effectiveness. So one of the visits is a bit longer to um, have the time to collect, you know, those blood samples. Mm -hmm. Um, when a person is looking at the sites um, that, that are offering this trial, are they required to go to the site closest to them or can they choose a preferable site? They could, if the site nearest to them works for them, that's great. If they would like to go somewhere else, that's fine too. Okay. Now I've heard rumors that some sites might be closed to new patients. Is that true? So at this time, we, we have 14 of the 15 sites that are accepting um, new patients at this time. We do have Dr. Miller down at University of Florida, who is quite busy with her uh, current subjects. And depending on bandwidth in the future, she may be able to um, sort of unpause her enrollment activity. But as of right now, she is the only site that is sort of on Hold. All right. If someone's interested in that site, is there a wait list that they could be part of? I would encourage them to email the study coordinator um, that's listed on the clinicaltrials.gov posting and see what their next steps might be. Alternatively, 
uh, if they would like to email the clinical trials at Harmony, I would be happy, or the company, <laughs> probably me, would be happy to uh, connect with Dr. Miller and uh, see where we can get them. Okay. Yeah, and, and what I would add, Susan, is I, I think, yeah, so Dr. Miller is, you know, has been busy with a lot of interest in, in terms of, you know, the patients that are currently in screening, but, you know, we are hoping to continue, you know, to collaborate with her um, and the potential to open things up, you know, at her site as well. So, um, mm -hmm. but if there, if there is interest by any families, um, as Crystal said, they can you know, reach out to that site or reach out to the Harmony team. Right. And what I've heard from you is there's 14 other sites as well. So if, if someone wants to be in the study, they don't have to do the Florida site. They could choose from one of the other 14 as well. Um, I'll just put a plug in for San Diego. The weather down here is fantastic. Come see us. Um, it's a great, a great excuse to come out here and see SeaWorld. Um, we're getting lots of questions about eligibility. And I think, you know, maybe we could help guide parents. If, if you have specific questions about your child's eligibility, what should you do? The first step is, and best step is probably getting in touch with the study coordinator to go through that list of study medications. Um, that's a great, that's a great topic to bring up during the pre-screening call. Uh, what, this, what the study coordinator or study doctor will do is go through your specific list of medications with you, tell you what's allowed, what's not allowed, if something might need a washout, if something needs to remain stable, and um, that would be the most efficient way to probably go about that. Um, we yeah, don't I think it, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, just reach out to, um, you know, one of the study sites, you know, the, the one closest to them or one that they're interested in. Again, our team is, is always available as a backup. But, you know, if there's any, you know, interest or questions, and, you know, as Crystal said, um, in terms of the pre-screening and, and going through sort of those inclusion, exclusion criteria to see, you know, a, as well as to get a better sense of that, that level of excessive sleepiness and um, and then all of that will help inform, you know, potential eligibility. Mm -hmm. um, at the conclusion of this webinar, I will be sharing this recording with everyone who registered, as well as the people who are on the line here. And in that email, I'll make sure to include a list of all of the sites with their contact information so that people can immediately reach out to the site of their choice. Um, with that, I would like to just thank, you know, the Harmony team for joining us today and, and letting us know a little bit more about this, uh, you know, really great clinical trial that, that you're providing for us. Um, I'd like to reiterate to everyone today that new treatments for PWS, they begin in clinical trials. So if your loved one is eligible and you're interested, please consider participating in the trial that's right for you. Um, and with that said, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we'll see each other soon, I hope. Have a great day. Great. Thank you, Susan.